The World Skeptics Congress, Paranormal, Supernatural, Fringe Science, Pseudoscience and How It Really Is. Berlin welcomes you. Welcome to the second session, Creationism and Islam. Our first speaker is Professor Johann Beckwith. He is a philosopher of science at the University, at Ghent University. His field is evolutionary biology and philosophy, and I was very happy to learn philosophy and anthropology. The is anthropology is my field. Would you please welcome Johann Beckwith? So, in fact, this should be, well, this should be 0%. Uh, this should be everywhere 100%, and this also sh should be 0%. If you would ask people a, a, a similar question like, do you think the Earth is round? You should expect totally different uh, answers, of course. Well, evolution, it's pretty much the same as the statement that the Earth is round. I mean, you, you all understand what I'm saying here. I know there's something like the Flat Earth Society, but okay, I'm not going to go into that here. All right. Now, Europe. We already heard a couple of things about this, and uh, I'm not going to repeat everything that is already said. There was an important um, resolution by the Council of Europe pointing out the dangers of creationism for education. So I think the Council of Europe is not going to put out a resolution like this if there's no cause to, to do it. If there's nothing to be worried about. Um, Eugenie Scott referred to the 
Minister of Education in Serbia, the Italian situation. There's, there's more, like in the Netherlands, this was not mentioned, I think. The Minister of Education uh, did something similar with respect to intelligent design. And I'm going to focus on the Netherlands here just as an example, uh, because this is the example I know best. Uh, Belgium is, of course, very close to the Netherlands. Uh, an interesting side remark, I think, or something interesting to remark, is that in Belgium, creationism really is not well organized. It's, it's there, but it's not really well organized. While in the Netherlands, it is. I'll, I'll talk about this in more detail. And I wonder why that is. There's people here from Holland, we can talk about this. I, I've talked about this, this many times, of course. One of the possible answers is that, of course, the Netherlands are for several centuries by now uh, a country with a Protestant background. And there's a difference between the Catholic background in Belgium, uh, that's due to the Spanish occupation uh, centuries ago. The Netherlands somehow escaped that. And um, so if you want to understand the differences in creationist beliefs in Belgium and the Netherlands, you have to go back for several centuries, which is in itself quite interesting. On the other hand, of course, Poland and Italy, for instance, are Catholic countries, and they do much worse than Belgium when it comes to accepting uh, evolutionary theory. So clearly, there's more going on than just that, of course. But however, I am going to focus on the Netherlands because this is what me and Stefan Blanco, we prepared this together, and other people of our group have been studying for the last couple of years. This man is called Johan Herbers. He is a very interesting guy. He's a young earth creationist from the Netherlands. And I spoke with him for one day. I visited him. Um, we had a very nice, long conversation. Um, this is something I, I want to remark in general. We're all skeptics and critical thinkers, but most of us, in my experience, just read articles and read books or write books and so on, but are only rarely really confronted with people who believe weird things. Now, it's very illuminating to actually get to meet someone like, for instance, Johan Herbers or anybody with a weird belief. I mean, Christianism is just my pet weird belief. Uh, system, but this applies to any weird belief, of course. And uh, you might be surprised how smart and intelligent these people often are. Right? You all know this maybe theoretically, but it's a different thing if you actually talk with them and you come up with anything you can think of. You mean, you, mean you, you talk science and facts and data and experiments, but they'll have an answer to everything. It's not going to be a good answer, but they will have an answer. And the, the reason for this somehow is, of course, that to be so stubborn about an extremely weird belief system, like the Earth is less than 10,000 years old and all, and all that. I mean, it all happened like the book of Genesis says. This is extremely weird if you think about it. And these people get a lot of resistance. They know the whole scientific community is against them. They know all these smart people called professors think what he believes is just ridiculous and so forth. So you need to be very tough-minded, so to speak, and stubborn to keep on believing in your own belief system, right? So do not underestimate these people. You need to be smart to be able to keep on convincing yourself in your own self-deception, if you know what I mean here, right? So uh, whatever you might think of, it's not going to be easy. It might even be impossible to change the mind of someone like Johann Herbers. And this applies, I think, to any uh, pseudoscience. Now this guy, as you can see, has built um, the Ark of Noah, but this is the small version. Because <laughs> he wanted to get it across the Dutch rivers, and so he, need, he needed to be able to pass, of course. So there's just a couple of inches left and right uh, that he spared, so to speak, to, to get his message across, the, the biblical message across, all over the Netherlands. But now he is working, and it should be finished by now, I think, on a true scale model. And of course, I ask him, how do you know the true scale? Well, it's in the Bible. I mean, feet and whatever the old uh, system is. So he calculated this, and he knows the exact size and everything of the true arc that has been there so many thousand years ago. And if, if you're into the Olympic Games, um, keep an eye on the opening session, because he's planning to be there on the Thames, the river the Thames, with his uh, Ark of Noah, true replica, true size replica. And that's a small thing, because he knows the whole world is going to see this, of course. I mean, every news station from any country 
will be there and we'll be filming him because it's going to be fun and eccentric and everything. And he's going to have real animals on it. You cannot have real animals on the local rivers because you need to have the permit of a zoo and everything. It's too complicated. But on the open ocean, apparently, the rules, these rules don't apply. So he's going to have real animals on his true size arc, and the whole world is going to see it. This man is called Kies van Helden, and he is responsible for the distribution of this leaflet or little book. It's called Evolution or Creation, What Do You Believe? And he had printed 6.6 .6 million copies of it. Now, there's only about 15, 16 million people in the Netherlands. So I guess pretty much everybody uh, has, has seen this thing. You need a lot of money to be able to print 6.6 .6 million copies of this thing. So apparently, he got somewhere the money. Although I know they're still short some maybe 40,000 euros or something. Stefan has the details. But, so that's my, that might be good news. He couldn't pay everything. But nevertheless, the, the, the largest part of the money needed for that, he was able to um, come up with it somehow. Now, this all happened, what I'm saying here, this Ark of Noah thing, this, this leaflet and so on. Of course, because these people knew and were alarmed by 2009, the Darwin year. So we have to understand this, in fact, as a response to, to what university scientists and, and people like you and me were doing with respect to the Darwin year, of course. Now, I'm going to be brief on the Dutch situation because I have this in detail, probably too detailed. Um, what do we find in that leaflet? Well, you can predict it, of course, by now. It's, it's, these are young Earth creationists. A worldwide flood explains the fossil. Evolution is inconsistent with the second law of thermodynamics. The drawings of Haeckel are exposed as frauds. As, these are old arguments, but they're still around. It's very hard to uh, get rid of them. Some uh, smart students from Utrecht University made this sticker that says, no creationism, yes, Darwin. They had it on their mailbox because they knew that leaflet was coming, so they wanted to not receive it. Anyway, that, that was a huge success in itself. Well, according to that man, Kees van Helden and his organization, the pamphlet action was a huge success. He says 100,000 euros, but it, it's less by now. Uh, anyhow, the effect, of course, was that young earth creationism was back in business, so to speak, in the Netherlands in that period. Uh, these people were on television, uh, shows that everybody watches in the Netherlands and in the Flemish part of Belgium. And uh, some newspapers and, and other people uh, did some polls, and they pretty much confirmed the, the Miller-Scott uh, Okamoto study. 42% of the Dutch population did not object to rendering equal time in school to both evolutionary theory and creationism. There was also the logic of equal time and balancing opinions, and it's only fair and, and so on, uh, behind that, of course. Very briefly, this in itself is also interesting. In the Netherlands, there's um, a broadcasting uh, company called the EO, the Evan Evangelical Broadcaster. This is one of the main uh, figures of that. He's, he's on TV pretty much every day, this man. Andres Knevel is his name. And he was a young earth creationist, but in 2009, in, in the middle of all this, he distanced himself from young earth creationism and even from intelligent design views, who, who were also becoming fashionable in those uh, days or, or in that year. And this caused a huge uproar among the creationist community itself. And this is quite interesting, because we're talking of creationism in general, but of course you know by now there's older creationism, there's younger creationism, there's um, intelligent design, there's theistic evolution, there's all kinds of things that we might all call label more or less creationist. But it's interesting to see how these people themselves disagree with each other. I mean, it's a huge difference whether you're a young earth or an old earth creationist. For us, it's all just plain weird, right, to use <laughs> polite terms. But for them internally, the differences are huge, of course. So this was interesting from an academic point of view to study what, what Naval caused the discussion in his own community, so to speak. Well, the whole discussion led to an apology, actually, by, by the guy. He felt he had, you know, said too much, as it were. 
And in interviews, he uh, indicated that he still respects the views and so on. I don't know exactly where he stands now, right? but the whole thing was, of course, very revealing and interesting. There were more books published uh, in the Darwin year. Let, let's just skip that uh, and go to more interesting things. Interesting was, of course, that Maria van der Hoeven, Ministry of Education, also said that she was not against the teaching of intelligent design. And she was inspired by that because of a man named Kees Dekker. And Kees Dekker is a, a world famous uh, scientist from Delft University who is um, internationally very famous for his work on nanotechnology. Right? So he doesn't really know much about biology, I think, but he's, he published in Nature, Science, and so forth on nanotechnology. And it's an interesting thing in itself that in the Netherlands, and that might be the same in other countries, that some important academic people in the Netherlands spoke out in favor of intelligent design. And this, for skeptical people, is, is a serious problem. It's, for instance, with doctors who, uh, who are in favor of homeopathy. As a skeptic, you all know what the general audience then says. Well, it can be that bad, or it cannot be that unscientific, because doctors accept it, right? So if academic people, you know, a, f a famous one even, says, well, the intelligent design idea, is that, that's not that bad, and so forth, and we have to give it a chance. That's a huge disadvantage for us, skeptical people, right? So then on top of it, you also have to point out that even very smart people can, can be very wrong about certain uh, things. So there were more people like um, Kees Decker, and they were all inspired by the American uh, intelligent design proponents like William Dembski, Michael Beagie, and so on. Many of you will be familiar with these names, I guess. Decker and others published several books in Dutch on intelligent design and creationism with you know, respectable looking books, respectable publishers and so on. They, um, they were sold uh, pretty well. There's an audience for it. Why do these academic people, if you ask them, why are they in favor of intelligent design? Well, it's a complicated situation, of course, but one of the things that we discovered is that they're all coming from an orthodox Protestant background. They were brought up in that. Then they go to university, learn to know the scientific method and so on. They, they became become physics and, and mathematicians and so forth. But they, they, they accept the science somehow, but they cannot get rid of certain aspects of their, the belief system from their youth. And intelligent design, I think, for many of them, somehow was a manner to, you know, to save both things that they had learned by then. And then you have the same old, same old um, reasonings. Evolutionary theory has shortcomings, cannot explain everything. For instance, cannot explain the flagellum of a bacteria. Uh, it's, an, it's an interesting example. Uh, the equate evolutionary theory with chance, also an old, an old one. Darwinism is only a theory, and so forth and so on. And design must have a chance in science. If you're familiar with the works of, say, Behe and Dembski, you will recognize this line of reasoning, of course. Case Decker also spread the word more internationally, I mean, in uh, Europe. However, surprisingly, in 2006 already, he distanced himself from intelligent design. And it's not yet clear why exactly he did that. He gave a couple of reasons, uh, for instance, saying that he was disappointed in the lack of ideas, pra lack of practical application, and so forth. Now he's calling himself a theistic evolutionist, which is an old uh, interpretation of evolution. Teilhard de Chardin, Catholic uh, Jesuit uh, paleontologist, was a theistic evolutionist. So there's a, an old uh, tradition in um, what you can call theistic evolution. And, and Case Decker became, after uh, being a proponent of intelligent design, although he denies that now, he became an adept of theistic uh, evolution. Now, to explain this more in detail, why intelligent design and theistic evolution has become successful in the Netherlands, at least for a while, um, I think lack of knowledge, and I'll go into this in the second part of my talk, about the basic mechanism and aspect of evolutionary theory, is, true, is clearly something important. I might not have the time to go into this in detail, so let me, let me be brief about it already now, because I think it's important. Many people, and maybe especially academics, say, in the field of physics or mathematics and so forth, 
away from biology, seem to think that evolutionary theory is easy. In fact, most people seem to think so. Like if, you, if you're in a bar, and uh, you, it's not going to happen that you're going to have a discussion with somebody about relativity theory. Because people know, well, I don't know nothing about relativity theory, so I better keep my mouth shut, right? It's, it's, it's complicated. I don't understand that, uh, so I better shut up. While about evolutionary theory, everybody has an opinion about it. It looks easy, right? Organisms change and species and fossils. We, we all know something about it. While in fact the details clearly are quite difficult. It's not a coincidence that it only exists from the 19th century, a true evolutionary theory. It's, it's complicated. And the misunderstandings about several aspects only prove the point, I think. People just think too quickly that they do understand it. Also, very smart people like Case Decker, maybe their smartness is even a handicap here with that res in that respect. Now, apart from that, there's of course also what you can call philosophical problems, right? People think evolutionary theory is problematic for human dignity, for the meaning of life, for morality, uh, for so many other things, right? Uh, you're, this has been already mentioned to you. Most of you will be familiar with that. I'll come back to that afterwards. If you haven't seen the documentary Expelled, documentary or mockumentary, as some people call it, this has been shown also on the Dutch television by the evangelical uh, broadcasting company. You, you should watch it. It's very interesting. But you have to be very, very, very critical, of course. But it gives a nice summary of pretty much every misunderstanding that people can possibly have about evolutionary theory. It's uh, made by people with a background in intelligent design and general creationism. And the comedian or actor Ben Stein, or Steen as it might be pronounced in the States, is presenting it. And, and at the end of the documentary, he's in the Natural History Museum in London looking Darwin in the eyes and, and saying things like, oh Darwin, what have you done? You're responsible for the concentration camps. And he's actually visiting a concentration camp and linking Darwin to the concentration camp. So he's looking him into the eyes and thinking, you're responsible for extremely bad things and so on. So that's the general line of argumentation in, in that documentary, so you can imagine. Now, I, I went to look in Darwin's eyes myself, <laughs> but I, I saw nothing of the sort. I mean, I only saw somebody who came up with a great scientific theory that makes it able to explain lots of empirical facts of nature. Okay. Now, in the Netherlands, to conclude this, intelligent design has indeed been a wedge, but different than was hoped for. I have to explain this briefly. There's an infamous document, you can find it on the internet, called The Wedge. It's a document written by intelligent design people. And you know what the wedge is, it's something like this. And they think that intelligent design should work as a wedge to split up the materialistic, atheistic, scientific, scientistic, and so forth thinking that dominates our culture now. And instead of all that, you want to have a more religious community and their general worldview. Now, the introduction of intelligent design in the Netherlands has worked as a wedge, but interestingly, not as was hoped for, but it worked as a wedge between the creationist community itself. This still needs, needs to be documented, but it's, it's interesting to, to notice that. Okay, more on creationism in Europe. As Eugenie Scott already pointed out, it's, it's, it's different from local tradition to local tradition. It depends, uh, yeah, is, is there an orthodox background, Catholic, Calvinist, and so on. In many cases, unlike what I spoke about uh, with respect to the Netherlands, there's less emphasis on the scientific status of creationist alternatives. It's more like an under-the-radar kind of thing. Uh, works in education and they, they keep it low profile and so on. But it's there. It's absolutely there. They use elements from US creationism. So a lot of uh, creationist stuff is, uh, is import. Uh, but not everything, though. For instance, a book by Juncker and Scherer, two German creationists, is translated in many European languages. And it's probably the most important creationist book in, uh, in Europe by now. Very briefly on Islamic creationism, but the next speaker will be go more in detail. Um, in, in our research group at Ghent University, we've done a study. It's too early to 
come up with results, but nevertheless, what we have now seem to be in line with some brief formal studies. This is in Dutch here, but let me just give you um, the main point. Um, a researcher did a master dissertation on, uh, some years ago on uh, Islamic creationism, and she find that 94% of uh, students in high school with an Islamic background believe in creation by Allah, so are against evolution. That's 94%, so that's a huge number. And from what we are, um, what we looked into now seems to confirm this. The man responsible for this, somehow, I think, is this man, Harun Yahya, you've all heard his name, I guess. Actually, there's a whole group of people writing these thick books like the Atlas of Creation. May, may I just ask you, who knows about the Atlas of Creation? Not everybody, but most people, but not everybody. Well, as you can see, the Atlas of Creation is a huge, thick book with beautiful photos in it. It must be very expensive. This is only the first part. He's planning on publishing 12. There are more now already, about two or three by now. Four already or three already? Well, and um, he has been sending, or his group from Turkey, operating from Turkey, has been sending them out all over Europe and, and the world, pretty much. So this must have cost millions and millions of euros or dollars or whatever, and we don't really know where the money is coming from. Other books, pamphlets, DVDs, they're very, very active. Uh, in fact, pick up the same argumentation as the intelligent design movement. Uh, Darwinism, as they call it, or evolution, uh, has a very bad ideological background, is responsible for racism, Nazism, uh, eugenics, and it, it's all there, right? That's, that's their main line of reasoning. However, interesting with respect to Islamic creationism, they also bring forward the idea that it is a Western invention, um, probably by the Freemasons, and it is in fact invented to destroy religion, particularly Islam. So you really have to know what you're dealing with if you want to discuss with young uh, Muslim people, for instance. They're gonna, what they're going to know about the evolutionary theory, they will know from the work done by Harun Yahya and his group. Is it an issue in Europe? It certainly is, right? So I'm going to skip this slide because Eugenie pointed out I only have 10 minutes left and I'm about halfway my talk. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to some... So to the most important things that I wanted to, to tell you. Well, this I pointed out, but it's worth repeating. Harun Yahya is very popular about, uh, among Muslim youth in Flanders and Brussels. We've done some research on that. Make no mistake, he's not very popular all over the world, especially in Europe, like in Indonesia or other Muslim countries. They, in fact, look down on him with some disdain, right? Uh, they're still creationists, but they don't like the Harun Yahya style of creationism. But in Europe, he's very popular, especially with young people. Now, why is that? Let me, my, in my interpretation or experience, this has not much to do with scientific reasoning. If you discuss this with uh, a young guy, say, uh, who's born and raised in Belgium, he's 15 or 16 years old, he's obviously quite smart, um, but he's Muslim. Uh, he rejects evolutionary theory, he's going to have a few notions of maybe the second law of turbulence, and chance, and, and, and you know, the old uh, ideas. But in general, that's not going to be his forte. That's not what it's all about for him. The general thing that we should realize, of course, is that for these people, the acceptance or belief in evolutionary theory is something like defending your soccer team, and wearing the, the right colors, so to speak, right? I mean, it's an identity issue. So you cannot support the wrong team. And evolutionary theory is something that belongs to the other team. So it's really an in-group, out-group issue. And that makes it all the more hard, of course, to deal with it, because someone like me, I've been invited several times in schools by biology teachers, for instance, to, because a majority of their students have a Muslim background, and they experience some problems, so they think, well, let's, let's invite the guy from university and he'll explain it to them. That's not working. Whatever I do, whatever you do, it's not going to work, right? Because we have the wrong colors, so to speak. We, we, we are supporters of the wrong team. 
So clearly this must come from the inside group. But it's very hard, even if somebody from the inside group accepts evolutionary theory, it's very hard for him or her to come out of the closet, so to speak. In London there was an incident with an imam who was in favor of evolutionary theory. He received death threats. That's also very interesting. All skeptics who appear in public to defend science and react to some kind of pseudoscience, you will receive hate mail, for sure. But death threats, I think that's something that belongs to the evolution creationism issue. So that means there's a lot at stake for, for creationist people. It's, it's not just a scientific issue, because if the evidence would be strong enough, I'm willing to give up some of the theories, scientific theories that I accept now. It would be tough, of course, and I would resist, and the evidence would be great, and would be good, would have to be good. But I would be capable of saying, okay, I was wrong, right? But they're not capable of doing it, because it's not about accepting a scientific theory, but about who they are. It's going to the core of their identity. That's something I think we should, should keep in mind. So implications for science education. I've mentioned already the most important thing. You need help from within the community, but there's, of course, the problem at the same time. And then the last thing, let me briefly point it out in a couple of minutes. What we should learn, I think, as teachers and educators is that with respect to evolutionary theory, there's some problems that always come back and that you really need to address or you're not going to get the message across. Many of them you're familiar with, but some may be not. Like, for instance, there's multiple meanings of the word Darwinism. Don't use it. It's confusing. Speak about evolutionary theory. Darwinism is a different thing for pretty much any, anybody you will mention the word Darwinism to. Some people will equate it immediately with social Darwinism. Some people will equate it with atheism. Only the scientists will think of evolutionary theory with respect to the word Darwinism. And even so, it's over 150 years ago, evolutionary theory itself evolved. Darwin himself would have difficulties in recognizing it, his own theory, of course, right? I mean, that's, that's normal. Explain that evolutionary theory, it's really five or six theories. There's common descent or not, there's natural selection, there's gradual or punctuated equilibrium kind of evolution. So there's this, it's several things. And you can accept evolution, but disagree on several of these theories or sub-theories. There are several internal technical discussions, of course. Uh, let me skip that. Address the question whether everything is adaptive or not. This is a butterfly, not a leaf. It's a butterfly. Use these kinds of examples to discuss questions like, how can we understand this? And really, I think this is one of the most important things. You can only understand this if you know what natural selection is all about or sexual selection if you give the example of a peacock tail or whatever, okay? Before Darwin, you only had chance or intelligent design. Intelligent design is a very old theory, right? Darwin have give, has given us a third alternative, so to speak, for this. But not everything in nature is adaptive, of course. These are the things I think that young people find very fascinating. It's pointed out. Children love evolutionary questions. This is what they love, right? Now, I totally agree with the former speaker that you should address evolutionary theory from an early age on because they find it very interesting. But on the other hand, that's also something I wanted to point out. Ironically, there's a lot of research going, now, going on now in developmental psychology and other uh, disciplines that explain from an evolutionary perspective why it's so hard to understand evolutionary theory. And maybe even especially with children. They're naturally born, uh, as we all were, Essentialists, for instance, and teleological reasoners. If you ask a six-year-old child, why, why do the clouds move? He's not going to give you some causal interpretation of high air pressure and everything. No, he's going to say, well, maybe it's time to go to bed and mama called or something. Uh, or why are rocks pointy? They're not going to give an explanation in geological terms. They're going to say, well, they don't like the animals scratching them or something or sitting on them, so that's, they defend themselves. That's the natural mental cognitive stance that children have, and it goes totally against the core aspects of evolutionary theory, right? So this is another thing, and it makes it more difficult, right? So the default position is against us, so to speak. That's what we have to keep in mind. 
Another thing that I like to point out, if you are confronted with some, someone, and there's lots of people who say, no, no, it's like it is in the Quran or the Bible or any other book, that's the way things have happened somehow. Because when, it, when you really go into a discussion with, say, a Muslim creationist, in the end he will point to the Quran. Or a young earth creationist from Christian flavor, in the end he will point at the Bible and so on. Well, I think an interesting remark is to point out that there's lots of sacred books. I mean, this is a collection of all sacred texts. This, these are just a few examples, right? Now, it's a fair question, I think. Why would the book that happened to be the favorite book of your parents or your subculture be the one that has it right? If by chance in, in the hospital at birth you were transferred to another uh, family, you would believe in another book, apparently. Right? Leave it at that. They'll, the smarter ones will understand what you mean by it. Last thing, I need one more minute. The <coughs> truly most important misunderstanding, even also with people like Case Decker, nanotechnologists at the university, is the equation of natural selection with blind chance. It's nothing of the sort, of course. You've all heard the comparisons between a watch, you know, a watch is so complicated and functional, you need a watchmaker. Or about the junkyard, this is from Fred Hoyle, a cosmologist, famous scientist, who didn't understand the ABC of evolutionary theory clearly, because this is his comparison, and it's still repeated and repeated on and on. Imagine there's a junkyard, and then there's a tornado, and next thing you know, there's an airplane, right? If you can explain to, say, a 15-year-old girl or guy or boy why this is totally, totally wrong, why this is, in fact, in, in several respects, the opposite of what evolution is all about, then you understand what the evolutionary theory is. Thank you very much. Thank you. We do have some time for questions. There are people with microphones. Would you please raise your hand? Uh, the man in the red shirt. My name is Reichmann, and I had 20 years ago an experience with one creationist. And I had a completely different understanding like you. It was quite easy to understand his arguments. Everything has created by God. And he believes that there is a God which has the power to do everything what he likes to do. And if he points out how old some kind of material is, according to the science, he was a scientist for himself, for himself, he said, if God is almighty, he can produce all the yeah. stuff in the material that it looks like just to prove the people if they are willing to believe. If you have somebody like this, you cannot arc like everything, because this is just the answer to everything. Yes. Um, no, there's still people around, of course, who follow that reasoning. I think it's, it's a less sophisticated form of creationism. Creationism itself has evolved also, of course. And especially if you, for instance, read the works of the intelligent design authors, it's, it's quite tough to understand. You need to know some biochemistry, for instance, to understand Michael Beagie's books. and. You need to know some, uh, some mathematics to understand some of these books and so on. But the argument that this man has given you reminds me of the argument that uh, was already given in the 19th century by a, a man named Gossi. He, he knew about the modern geology of his time, Charles Lyell and so on, pointing out the Earth has to be much, much older than, say, 10,000 years. And Gossi came up with the reasoning that the fossils and everything, in fact, that we experience has been recently created, some thousand years ago, but it looks as if it's already old. And of course, God can do that. It's to test our belief somehow. Even in the Garden of Eden, if you would have cut down a tree in the Garden of Eden, the tree would already have year rings. You know what I mean? As if it's old. If you would have dug a hole in the Garden of Eden, you might have found fossils and oil, for instance. Or, okay, now some, some brands of young earth creationists still repeat that argument, but not all of them, because for some of them, or maybe even for the majority, I'm sure Eugene Scott knows more about this, 
maybe for the majority, it makes God some kind of a joker, right? I mean, God puts fossils in the ground to test our belief. What is this for? What is this nonsense? So the creationists themselves are divided on that issue. There's an old debate about the question whether Adam and Eve had navels, belly buttons. Yeah. Martin Gardner has written a, a book with the title on it, uh, Did Adam and Eve ha Had a Belly Button, something like that. Now, some creationists think, um, yes, they had a belly button. Like uh, Gossi said that in the 19th century, because God has made them with a belly button. Although, of course, they didn't need a belly button. I mean, you, you, you understand the logic, right? But creationists now still discuss this. And for instance, the creationists uh, of Answers in Genesis, who are responsible for the Creation Museum in Kentucky, which is a wonderful museum. You should go. I mean, I've been there. It's great to visit. It's, a, it's entering a parallel universe somehow. It's, <laughs> it's an interesting experience. Well, but they have Adam and Eve uh, you know, in the museum. So they're like rebuilding the book of Genesis. And Adam and Eve do not have belly buttons. They don't. Because it's, it's plain logic from their perspective. I mean, God created them, so they're not born. So God is no joker. He's not going to give them belly buttons. It's as simple as that. So this line of argumentation is still there, true. But there's a lot more sophisticated creationism than that around now. Can we have a question from this side of the room? If there is a question from this side of the room, there we go. Yeah, speaking of God's mentality, if we can, uh, there is a, a saying by Einstein, subtle is the Lord, but he is not malicious. So I, I think that answers that kind of question. <laughs> Thank you. Question from this side of the room? Man in the plaid shirt, or a striped shirt. Okay. Uh, I just would like to add something to this question that uh, I think we have to teach people that uh, science is not only to explaining what we experience, but science can make predictions. And I think that's the difference between that reasoning, that, that evolutionary theory is a tool to predict things, what we don't know yet. And their explanation is not able to predict anything. Yeah, we don't have the time to go into this now, I guess, but I'm not sure about it. Because, for instance, creationist cosmologists predict what they're going to find when they look at, say, the light coming from a star or something. They can predict it from their perspective, and they will be right. I mean, the light was created so many thousand years ago, so if you point your telescope to a certain spot, you might expect that light will look as if it's been underway for millions or billions of years, but from their view, it's going to be different and so on. So somehow they can deal with that. And from the other perspective, they will, they will point out that in evolutionary theory, you can do certain predictions. You can predict what you're not going to find and are going to find in a certain geological layer, for instance. But you cannot predict the future of a species or the way adaptations will, what, what they will be like uh, in the future, and so on. They will not hesitate to, you know, have the boomerang effect of your own argument. So, I think. Thank you. Uh, I think I saw another hand on this side of the room. Come on, we're giving you guys your chance here. I thought for sure. All right, then it's back to the questions, questioning side of the room here. Oh, uh, I uh, was compliment some remark of my friend Johan uh, that uh, he says that young Muslims defend themselves uh, their religious fear of, of uh, because they um, they supporting their group, the, their, their team. group. But of course, uh, the problem is that in Western Europe, also in Germany. Most of the Muslims be, be belongs to belong to immigrant groups, most of North African and Turkish origin, who are more or less discriminated, who have a sense that they have discrimination, and perhaps this remark had to be made too. Uh, and so they feel perhaps an attack uh, on the creationism as an attack on a religion uh, and that yet another form of discrimination. 
That's yes. quite difficult for us to explain it, and I know that you're being criticized because you're criticizing Islam, and so you are discriminating them. Yes, well, what, what Tim is referring to, among other things, uh, I've, I've had a debate with an imam on television, and, and indeed, it was very polite and everything, but uh, many Muslims think that when you defend evolutionary theory, you're really criticizing their religion. So that's just the way it is. And the logic indeed is that if you're already discriminated, you're going to give an interpretation to, to someone, uh, what I'm doing, as even more discriminating and so forth. That, that's indeed the logic you, you almost cannot avoid. I can only say that we need to find ways to get out of that trap, because frankly, be, just because they're already discriminated, they, they do not find their way to the universities or higher education, to the better jobs and so on. And now on top of that, they also turn themselves willingly into pseudoscientists. It makes it even worse, of course. It's a solicitation to be even more discriminated, right? So, so they're, it's kind of a vicious circle. They're, they're stepping into themselves. And the truly bad thing is indeed that the efforts that we are trying to do to get them out of it push them more, even more into it. That's something I worry about pretty much every day. Uh, as you're, when you're in education, you know what I'm talking about. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. The World Skeptics Congress, Paranormal, Supernatural, Fringe Science, Pseudoscience, and How It Really Is. We're skeptical.